My name is Kevin Hines, and in the year 2000, I nearly died by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. I was depressed, I was terribly suicidal, and I thought I was a burden to my family. This was the furthest thing from the truth. I am beautiful, and so are you. Life is the greatest gift we've ever been given, or will ever be given. So live it with me, and be here tomorrow, and every single day after that. Welcome to the Mental Health Marvels Podcast. Hey, <laughs> Mr. Cook, how are you, how my are friend? You, Kevin? Good to see you. Pleasure to come oh, out. Oh man, it's so great to have you here on the podcast. This is Mental Health Marvels Podcast. Uh, once again, I'm Kevin Hines. We are here with my man, Kevin Cook, who's going to tell you his wonderful, powerful, emotive story in just a moment. Uh, but this is Mental Health Marvel's podcast, as you can see. We're always climbing to find ways to help people heal through their pain, find that light at the end of the tunnel, and that road to recovery. Kevin, Kevin, uh, tell us how we met and connected um, and, and, and where we know each other from, and then we'll get right into your amazing and powerful story. Yes, yes. I was an employee of the uh, we, what we call the mobile crisis team, uh, and and there I uh, was what was called a care navigator, uh, which is the individual who uh, reaches out to individuals post crisis. In other words, when the crisis is over, I would call them and talk to them over the telephone and just to make sure things were okay and that they would no longer in crisis or having any uh, suicidal ideation and things of that nature. So my friend, so you, so you work at Mobile Crisis. Yes. You did. And, and, and you help people find ways to find resilience to stay. Exactly. Uh, and and give it, can you give us one example of a situation where you helped an individual recognize that they were they're worthy of staying here? Well, sure. Uh, I, you know, being a person, a certified peer specialist means that I myself and my story uh, is uh, allows us to connect with one another. So I utilize my story to connect with individuals and to let them know that, for one, they're not alone. Uh, for two, that there is help. And further on, you can find hope that you are able to recover from this crisis that you're serving right now. That crisis, of course, at the moment feels monumental, but we just you know, know that you have support and friends like myself who will get you through that. Um, in a specific example, I, I really like to go to this one, is a young man who was, you know, experiencing some suicidal thoughts. Uh, he was also having some deep psychoses, um, you know, uh, writing on the wall with his feces that, yes, that, um, you know, that the world was coming to an end or whatever uh, psychotic he uh break he was having at that time but his mother he lived in the house with his mother and she also called uh, law enforcement and I just so happened to beat them there that's just how dedicated a mobile crisis oh, guy I am wow. I beat the cops there um, and was talking he and I connected right off right away and but by that time cops showed up and they were pistols drawn they came in, it was like seven of them. And, you know, if they didn't have their hands on their guns, they had their hands on their taser. So they were going to either tase or shoot this man. Uh, and, or, in, instead of, you know, allowing a mental health professional to get him to calm down and to agree to go into the hospital. And so by the time they got there with their pistols drawn, uh, I myself uh, elected to remain calm and to I put myself between him and the police. Uh, and and their guns drawn. Their guns were drawn. Now on you. Now on me. For some reason, I just decided that this man's life was more important than mine. And I think that that also encouraged him, you know, to go into the hospital because I thought he could, he saw right then and there the uh, the the direness of the situation uh, that he could die at that moment, even though he was thinking about 
harming himself anyway. Um, so needless to say, uh, you know, we got the ambulance there and got him on the, uh, on the ambulance. I followed him to the hospital and talked him through the entire intake process and just let him know, you know, I'm going to be available once you find treatment and once you get out of treatment, you know, he and I, uh, can still remain uh, individuals who talk to each other and you know we talk about these things sometimes now uh, that same individual yeah staying in contact staying in care being there as a, as a shoulder to lean on a crime when in need yes doing the job every day helping countless people Kev I love it I, I love mean, my job oh, man Kev. these people I mean I, I see myself in just about everybody I encounter you know in uh you know, somebody was there for me to help save my life. So I'm looking at that as, you know, just a chance. Uh, the good Lord put me here to try to, you know, help individuals and try to save their lives. Kevin, they say, if you don't see beauty in the next person you meet, you ain't looking hard enough. <laughs> That's you right. I mean? And I, I look for oh, it every man. time. Man. Every time. Kevin, let's go back. Okay. Let's go back. You were, you were a child. And... Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, for some people it's going to get heavy. Yes. But I, wanna, I want you to talk about this in the way you feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we, we got a few facts from you before you came on the show today. Yes, sir. About ten facts that you put in chronological order for us. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, helps us build this narrative around your life story. At seven years of age, you were raped by a stranger. Yes. Um, uh, what did that do to you, Kev? And how did it shape who you've become? It was a hugely traumatic experience for me. As a matter of fact, uh, so traumatic that I, you know, blanked it out for seven or eight more years. Uh, but once I, you know, I have cousins, and, and your cousins are supposed to love you, but my cousins were teasing me, and, you know, they were calling me names, and uh, oh, Kevin, you got poked. You got poked when you were seven. And then suddenly it came back to me, those memories of the gentleman, you know, just a, a fully grown man. And he threw me in glass when he was done with me like a piece of balled up tissue uh, or trash. And, the, and so those memories, his face, the pain that I, you know, felt at that time, the embarrassment that I felt, uh, how dirty and smelly I was because they were broken beer bottles and so I was in beer and urine and things like that. So, you know, that memory had came back with a vengeance. And from that moment on, I acted out. I was, you know, I was mad at my mother for not protecting me even though she told me, don't go with this stranger. Don't go with strangers. Just stay in the car. And he offered me candy and I followed him. So I, my behavior just, I was a, I was a good student at that time, you know, getting straight A's and, uh, you know, doing the right thing. But once, once that memory came back to me, my behavior just changed suddenly. And I, you know, I acted out and I was disruptive and destructive, tearing up things and, and man, it was, yeah, violent, yeah, yeah. hitting people. For no reason, I, I started hearing voices, and the voices would say, look, they're laughing at you. They're talking about you. And I would say, really? And I would go over there and, uh, you know, if a person would not tell me, well, no, we weren't talking about you, I would hit them. How old were you? I was 15. So you were enraged? Enraged. You, you know, you, you, you were strong, and you wanted to, wanted to take it out of something. I was, would take it out on individuals. They had no idea uh, what was going on because it was just me and the voices. Yeah. How did you come to terms with and then find peace from such pain? Well, you know, I continued to struggle uh, with my behavior. Um, got to a point to where I joined the Army. Um, and didn't do well there. I, they, they, they kicked me out in about two years. Uh, so it was, I was oscillating between 
the Kevin with the intelligence and the Kevin who is, uh, you know, uh, so violent and, and so destructive. Uh, but I managed to, you know, I don't know what the coping skills were at that time, uh, you know, because I was, I was a uh, chemist while I was in the army. Mm -hmm. So you know, I had some good, uh, good logical uh, sense, but I would always destroy it or, or find some way to sabotage any kind of career choices I make. Marriage, I got married found a way to destroy that because mm. because what had happened was I started drinking uh, trying to self-medicate found drugs at that time started out marijuana ended up crack cocaine okay. so my life was still going I was just you know I was functioning you know getting jobs uh, but I would always find a way to get out of it, find my way out of that job and destroy it. Destroy relationships, destroy opportunities, classic uh, aggressive behaviors of someone who's been, been broken yes. inside. That trauma was uh, that trauma tremendous. Was very real. Yeah. Kev, uh, at what point uh, did you get arrested for armed robbery? I was just getting out of the army. And so, like I said, my behaviors had become so just destructive and, and so um, got with some friends and we were out stealing beer, breaking into the stores, stealing beer and drinking beer. And so it escalated when one of the friends decided he was going to rob the place. And, you know, they put the silent alarm on and the police came out banging, blah, blah, blah. And, shot up my van and my life began to slowly pass before me. I could even see bullet fragments going in slow motion. I remember it so well. Bullet fragments going in front of my face. And, um, but somehow I had never gotten into any kind of trouble with the law before that. So they let me go with a five-year probation sentence. Yeah. Wow. And I was facing 50 years. You wouldn't see that today. Yeah. That wouldn't happen today. Not even for a first offender. Oh, no yeah. way. So, yeah, I had some, somebody was watching over me and, and allowed it to, and I managed to get through probation without any incidents, you know, even though I was still drinking and drugging the whole time. When you were 22, you had a, a heightened um, drug and, and, and drinking and uh, substance use. Yes. Uh, some people call it disorder. Some people call it issues. We'll, we'll leave it to you to call it what you needed to call it. But you, 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 were, you were damaging your insides from the outside. Yes. And, and how long did that go on? And how did you find the will to live as you do today in recovery? Well, I call it self-medicating because I had a undiagnosed mental health diagnosis at that time. I don't like to say illness. I say mental health diagnosis. It's not an illness. Uh, but so I had what was known as they call it personality disorder where, you know, you would have uh, these intermittent uh, episodes where I would introvert and, and, and shy away from people and and uh, and that's what I call the good me. Then you know the doctor <laughs> the doctor Jekyll of me. So I would be intelligent and do the right thing. Uh, and then Mr. Hyde would come out and I would drink liquor and smoke crack and smoke marijuana. And it went on for nineteen years. Wow. So I was in and out of uh substance use in and out of uh, recovery facilities uh, you know relapsing each time because I would never face my trauma which was the core of me uh, you know with all the self-medicating in the first place the trauma on top of the mental health diagnosis so 
for the people watching or the people listening, and, and, and for some people's inability to be empathetic with an individual such as yourself at the time of what you were going through, you know, we look at young kids today of any ethnic makeup or background, uh, but especially uh, those of minority backgrounds, who are, going, who are shaping behaviors that are destructive, violent tendencies, aggressive, um, hurtful, and we blame them. Yes. We incarcerate them. We put them in juvie. We tell them that they're not meant for society. We don't tell them that. We show them that. Right. In this country, in this society. And how would you ask, uh, you know, an individual who was apathetic to find empathy in their hearts? to see the beauty in a young man today mm -hmm. that went through something similar like yourself. It was very difficult back in my day. Mm -hmm. it's, it's become a lot easier now because you're finding so many uh, famous people who also had mental health diagnoses and were able to overcome those things. Um, I would just say to uh, individuals who think that it's, uh, it's, it's not a disease or it's, not, uh, it's a moral issue to you know, really try to look and recognize even in themselves those instances where they might have been impulsive and, and having thoughts that say, do this or do that. With us, sometimes those thoughts are uncontrollable. Sometimes those thoughts are so um, overwhelming that we just have to do what these these voices tell us what to do. I mean, it's um, I was really at I was a slave to the voices. Mm -hmm. The voices were my masters, and I had to do what they say do, or there were going to be some dire consequences in my mind so you know if you believe that it is a uh, you know it's a moral issue please uh, just uh, with me uh, try to understand that my brain had a fracture in it at that time my brain was broken and so you know, if you are able to understand a broken arm or a broken leg, understand a broken brain and a broken heart. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully that will be able to allow you to have some sort of sympathy or empathy for individuals like myself. That's a beautiful answer, Kev. And I think that instead of judging people for behaviors they're exerting, try to, come, try to meet them where they're at, right. understand where they come from, what lack of opportunities they may have had, or, 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 or what part of what lack of opportunities they've been uh, bestowed upon, given their the, where and when they were born. Yes. You know, it, we look at things like, I mean, look at the two of us, gentlemen, right? Yes. You even called the the man earlier in this interview, who who, who raped you, a, a gentleman. Yes. He, and 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 for you to do that is big of you. That's bold of you. That's a that's a that's a word that means that, you know that he too is a human being exactly who who behaved in the way he did because maybe of something that happened to him precisely precisely so if we can be empathetic to even those who tortured our souls mm -hmm. hurt us then we can find in our hearts to forgive and if we can forgive not necessarily in the biblical sense but if we can forgive someone for hurting us we can always move forward right and look how much forward you've moved Kev You've moved so far in a forward direction; it's unbelievable. Let me just let me just read off some of the amazing things you've done in your life, and I don't mean to be reading from my notes, but this is too important for me to miss. Okay. Um, you know, uh, your recovery begins at age forty-two. Yes. Right, and and you start volunteering these opportunities. You find yourself in the spiritual awakening. We're talking about that in a minute. You have your two thousand eleven CPS certification. Yes. You have your two thousand thirteen WAM certification. Two thousand fourteen, you become a part of the Moral Crisis Team. In 2019, this year, you became a health and wellness coach at Grady Health Systems Integrated Care Department. Kev, from where you were to where you are today, it's a stark difference. Uh, along that path, helping so many people, um, what are those 
you know, some would say accomplishments. What do you call them? What do they mean to you? I call them uh, blessings because um, I would say at age 42 that I had that spiritual awakening. And it's key that I just, if you give me just a moment to explain it. In the interim of my drug-driven uh, mental health challenges, I was getting into, I would say, relationships at the time, but they were driven by drugs, exchange of drugs for sex. Uh, but in the interim, I had gotten a young lady pregnant, and we had a child together. We lived in another woman's basement and was getting high down there with the baby in the room. And one, it just, just, you know, one day I was playing with the baby. It was, it was her time to, her turn to hit the pipe. And I was playing with the baby. And at a moment of clarity, it all became real clear to me. This is insane. This baby does not deserve it. And I just started crying, crying. And I was like, baby, one of us, we, this baby don't deserve this. One of us has to go into rehab. I mean, like now. And without the young lady even having an opportunity to answer that baby, she had a real little bitty fingernail on her finger. And she poked me as if to say, you are the one that's going into rehab right now. She poked me underneath my eye. So I was already crying, but it started bleeding. So I looked and I saw my reflection in this glass because we're in a basement, there was no mirrors. But I saw my reflection and I was crying a blood tear. And I was like, okay, God, I get it. I get it. <laughs> it's got to be me. In the middle of the night, I didn't wake anybody up. Two o'clock in the morning, I grabbed what little bit of uh, things that I could grab and I walked all the way to the VA hospital in Decatur which was something like 26 miles. And from that, I have not looked back from that day forward. I, you know, tried to follow up with the, uh, with the baby. I found out that the baby had to be adopted by a beautiful family. She has been raised uh, because the young lady continued in her addiction. Uh, but the baby has been being raised by a wonderful family. And so I decided just stay out of her life because I don't want to re-traumatize her. Uh, but that spiritual awakening from that moment on, I knew who I was working for. It's not Grady. It's not the mobile crisis team, but I'm working for a higher calling. And so knowing that is the reason why I put my heart into every person that I encounter. And, and I think that... Um, you know, you know, having that uh, motivation uh, from on high, you know, it keeps me young. I'm 58 years old now, and people are always telling me that I'm, you know, I'm, I look young and I act young because, I, you know, I'm working on uh, borrowed time right now. Mm. Yeah, and another thing about this spiritual awakening, Kevin, is... Like two days before, I had thought about hanging myself in that very basement because I didn't know how to stop. I, I couldn't stop. I wanted to stop, and I wanted to get help, but I didn't know how. And so I had, you know, there's a little pipe going over the, through the, the middle of the basement. I had my rope. I had threw it across there, uh, but it was so thin of a rope that, you know, it couldn't hold my weight. And so that's what saved me. And so the next night is when, you know, I walked all the way to the VA hospital, brother. How many miles? 26 miles. 26 miles. Yes. <laughs> and my feet were tired. But I made it. 26 miles and tired but alive. And here you are well and good today. Thank you. The accomplishments you've, you've had have been immense and powerful and helped a lot of people. Kev, we love you. 
We and love you as you, well, Kevin. You are the definition of a mental health marvel. That's why we're having you on the show. We're grateful for your presence here, my friend. There's, uh, I can't. I don't have no words. You know, I just. Kevin, you are an amazing individual too, man. Every time I see you in your podcast, and, and you have just been going, 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 going ever since you know your thing. And so I'm just so proud of you, brother. And and I'm looking at you, amazing. I I see you working out with the ropes sometimes and doing the jogging, man. It's just so amazing. You look great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And and you know it's just an inspiration. I use. I hope you don't mind. I use you as an inspiration in some of the uh, patients that I see over at Grady. I would I put your uh, picture up, or I let them watch you know one of your uh, podcasts or your movie, um, and it's inspiring. Uh, people are, where can I get it? Where can I? Let's go to iTunes <laughs> <laughs> and pick it up, man. So I hope. You know, I've helped the sales increase a little bit. I don't know how much. <laughs> well, Kev, but, uh, you know what you did help? You helped people find hope in your message in the film. Uh, Kev, of course, Kevin Cook was in the film, Suicide the Ripple Effect, with Wendell Fields, who you'll see in the podcast, uh, by Grady Cherry, myself, Margaret, and everybody else in the production. Yeah. We had a part to play in that film. A lot of people to make that movie possible. Yeah. A lot of great, beautiful, amazing folks. And Kev, you were a big part of it, and we're grateful. Kev, um, this has been one of my favorite interviews. Thank it's a quick you. one, but uh, impacted me to my core. Um, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your deep and, and, and personal story. And thank you for your amazing smile because you walk in here <laughs> with your great threads. I called you Kevin Kev when I first met you all those years ago. I know, inside, man. Inside Behavioral Health Link. And um, you, you're, you're making people smile every day. You're a beautiful human being. And that's how we'll take it away. Thank Ladies you, and gentlemen, man. This is the Mental Health Marvels podcast. You're watching the episode with Kevin Cook. Please like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. And if you're listening on the listening platforms, we're going to have it on, which is across most of them, uh, share it with a friend. Share it with someone you love. Share it with someone who's struggling, because it might just change their life. Be well. Be good, kind, and compassionate to every person you ever come into contact with, because you never know what they're going through on the inside. And be here tomorrow. Damn it. Be here tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Bye. My man. Uh, Thank you, brother. See you. Thank you all. We're out. Cheers, my friend. That was nice.